Alrighty, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for this fascinating lecture. My name is Rachel Christone. I'm the Director of Education here at the Salem Witch Museum. And I'm joined here by another member of our education department. You want to say My hi? name is Jonah Hoffman. Yes, I'm an education associate here, proctoring with Rachel. Uh, so before we get started, just a couple of quick housekeeping announcements. Uh, so please note this, this uh, lecture is being recorded and we will share it on our website for future accessibility. So within that, we do ask that everybody please mute your microphones for the duration of this presentation. And I will be keeping an eye and just making sure all the microphones are muted as we go so it's not distracting. Uh, and we will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. So please hold them until the end. Um, and you can uh, pop them in the chat when we get to the end of the lecture. Um, and we will have some time for questions then. And then finally, if you don't already, we ask, uh, please feel free to follow us on social media, Salem Witch Museum, on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. That's the best way to find out what new programs we have uh, and what projects are taking place here at the museum. Now, we are thrilled tonight to welcome uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Leo Igwe. Dr. Igwe holds a doctoral degree in religious studies from the University of Beirut in Germany and wrote his doctoral thesis on witchcraft accusations in northern Ghana. Dr. Igwe is the Director of Advocacy for Alleged Witches, an organization doing incredibly important work bringing awareness to the deadly witch hunts ongoing in Africa today. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our guest speaker. Okay, um, thank you, Rachel, for that introduction. And thank you, the Salem, the Salem Witch Museum, for the opportunity to virtually interact and reflect on witch hunting in Africa. I was deeply moved to know that a museum that is dedicated to the Salem Witch Hunt victims exist in the US. Such a facility is a tribute and a testament to these innocent victims of human witnesses. And I hope that it will be possible to establish such a museum in my country, Nigeria, in my continent, Africa, where persecution of witches are, uh, is ongoing. In fact, I. I, I think that it is important that I, um, my own part of the world should begin the process of healing and apology, exoneration, repentance, and closure. And But to establish such a facility like the museum, the persecution of alleged witches has to stop. Africa must take the much needed generational leap of reason and enlightenment. Unfortunately, at the moment, this process has not happened, which hunting rages across the region. In the past few months, in the past few months, some cases of witch hunting have been recorded across the region. And you can see from the slide, you can see a mob behind a woman being led out from the village. She was accused of witchcraft, mobbed. Uh, they took her actually to, to her father's, uh, father's uh, home, father's village, but the villagers rejected her. But eventually they took her to a, a nearby bush, beat her to death and buried her there. And this, this one happened just last year. So in Nigeria, media agencies have reported the gruesome murder of, of an alleged witch, Ms. Mata Maman, in northern Nigeria. Ms. Maman accused, after some incidents of death in her community, was murdered in cold blood. They, they alleged she killed some persons through witchcraft, and some youths in the community attacked her like they did to the woman on the slides, and they beat her to death and burnt her body. The police have arrested some suspects and the investigation is ongoing. Now, in, in the past uh, few months, there have been reports of other cases in, uh, in other parts of Nigeria and, the, and, and, and Africa. 
an irate mob set ablaze and its 89 year old man, as you can see on the slide, Justin in Benue State in central Nigeria. Some youths attacked him after a soothsayer said that he caused the death of a young man in the village. And as you as you have seen in that uh, uh, on the slide there, uh, Pa Justin was set ablaze, and uh, that was about midnight by youths in the village. But uh, we managed to rescue him, and and we took him to the hospital. And you can see on the other the other photo there is uh, Pa Justin after he has gone through some medical uh, uh, medical treatment. In, in Bauchi State, also in Nigeria, a man murdered the uncle after a child confessed that the elderly man initiated him into the witchcraft world. This is also another kind of narrative. Uh, sometimes when people, when, when you give a child uh, cookies, biscuits, as a case maybe, or sweets, people could allege that the child has been initiated. And that initiation is enough for the person to be attacked or killed by the mob in the community. In Malawi, witch hunters have been on a rampage, attacking, killing, lynching, and stoning alleged witches to death. An angry mob killed an elderly woman. Seven, uh, she, she was 72 years, following suspicions of witchcraft. She was accused of killing her granddaughter through through the court means. The young girl took ill and was taken to a hospital where she was pronounced dead. A mob stunned the, the home of the elderly woman, vandalized her property, and then beat her to death. In another case, a, witch hunt, a, a woman was also accused of killing a relative who died in South Africa and was punished. And, uh, and, um, and during the funeral, this woman was pushed into the grave of the disease. She was fortunate and some attendees rescued the woman, but she lost two of her teeth. You can see from on the slides, the woman, the, the woman, two of them were there trying to cover the grave because what happens in, in some parts of Malawi is that if you're accused of being responsible for the death of somebody, they will, they will compel, they will force the person to cover the grave. And when she was doing it, they pushed her into the grave. But she was fortunate that there were some people who came around and helped you know, uh, rescue her, but she lost two of her teeth. Now, in Zambia, there is a practice they call the Chikondo practice. This is a practice, um, this practice is said to be a magical moving coffin. Yes, that's the belief. They believe that when people die, they could carry them in a coffin and, and they can now bring in a traditional priest who will do some incantation and enjoin the dead person to identify who was responsible for the death. So they call it Chikondo. So this form of post-mortem witch hunting ritual is conducted too often in rural communities and people carry the coffin and get it to identify those who are responsible for the death. And in this case, a young man died after a brief illness and during the funeral, his relatives conducted this Chikondo ritual and in the process, the coffin hit uh, some persons in the community. The mob pounced on these suspected witches, they hit them with sticks and two of them sustained injuries. And, um, and in a related incident, a head of a community was also indicted in the course of this Chikondo ritual and, um, and, and uh, they beat the man up and buried him alive. So this one happened early this year in Zambia. And we have had similar cases also in Nigeria where alleged witches were also buried alive. Now, in Kenya, we also have cases where alleged witches are beaten up and murdered by their family members. Now, these cases have illustrated that witch hunting is an ongoing phenomenon, is an ongoing uh, abuse, an ongoing and terrific campaign in the region. 
which persecution is not is not is not history as you know as i saw today you know i came to the museum and i was being told about something that happened centuries ago now this did not happen centuries ago now if you look if you look there on the slide you will see a young man charging towards an elderly a woman now look that woman is that's a grandmother and that the grandmother did not make it. He end, he ended up butchering the grandmother right there and set the grandmother and set the uh, the the cops ablaze. And if you also look at the other picture there, is you know, these are also two women who were also set ablaze in Kenya. And these incidents happened in the past one or two years. And there are also other cases in other parts in um, in Malawi, in Nigeria, and other places. Now. There have been there have been concerns as to why is this thing taking place, and and uh, some scholars have tried to explain why why the why witch hunting is taking place in the region. Meanwhile, witch hunting rages targets men and women, children and adults, because very often people uh, uh, the explanation is that this um, this campaign of violence and abuse. Yes, they target some communities, but what happens is that what we see are those who are who are caught at the end, who suffer the extreme abuse. People are beaten, people are banished, people are attacked, people have their house set ablaze. Sometimes people are uh, you know are, are ostracized from their homes. So people are sanctioned in so many ways. But what we see very often are those who suffer you know the brutal and extreme forms of punishment. Now, everybody is susceptible of, uh, to being accused of witchcraft, but not everyone could be attacked or killed, as illustrated above. Yes, you can make accusations, you can suspect people, but it's not everybody that can be attacked or killed. So that is why those who are attacked or killed are those who make the news. Meanwhile, a lot of people live in situations where they are suspected by their neighbors or, co or community members. Now, those in powerful social cultural positions are suspected and branded witches, but accusations are covered. Witch hunting of the powerful is seldom public. Witchcraft accusers, witchcraft accusers fear tackling suspected witches who are in strong social cultural positions. If you suspect somebody who is very powerful in the community, you, people don't usually express that openly except they, they need to mobilize and get the mob, you know, to really maybe come and they will just come to the person's compound and set the place ablaze. So it really happens that powerful people who are suspected get mob or get brutally killed as we have seen on the slides. So, but because, um, yes, witchcraft accusers fear tackling suspected witches who are in strong social cultural positions because they could get their accusers they arrested, charged, or prosecuted. Those in strong social cultural positions have the means and mechanism to defend themselves and neutralize allegations. So they have the means to invite the police, hire the lawyers, or seek redress in courts. So this is exactly why when we have these accusations that the elderly ones, widows, um, single women, women who are living alone, or sometimes men who are living alone, or who are poor, or who are elderly. These are usually the people who suffer these extreme forms of punishment. Now, as you can see from the, from the next slides, this is, a, this, is a, this is Aqua Dante from Ghana. She was beaten to death and the and the body and the body and the cops was set ablaze by a mob and as you can see there people were standing so this is not like and I saw something happening between two people or three people in a place so this is public people were just standing so this kind of um we see we we we, we experienced this kind of incidents recently where people will come together, they will be watching as somebody is beaten to death or somebody is butchered to death you know, by, by their accusers. So this happened in Ghana some years ago and efforts have, been, efforts have been made to arrest and prosecute those behind that. On the slide also, you will see, um, you will see some women. 
These women are in what they call witch camp in Ghana. Actually, these places are not witch camps um, because uh, locally, these are refuge centers. These are places when people are suspected, elderly women, if they are suspected, they run to these places, they take refuge there. But incidentally, they call that witch camp by so doing, misrepresenting, you know, what the place stands for. These women flee their communities when they're being suspected or when, when they think that they could be attacked or killed. So they go to these places. Unfortunately, many of them end up spending the rest of their lives there. In fact, I was, during my field work, I visited these camps and some of these women, maybe if I, some of them I met when I came the first time, a few months later, I came back again, they have died because nobody was taking care of them. So it's a kind of punishment for people when they flee to these places. And this is in Ghana, in West Africa. So, so the poor and the vulnerable members of the society who lack the means to invite the police or to go to court or conduct autopsy are often those who are attacked or killed in the name of witchcraft. Now, in post-colonial African societies, alleged witches are endangered species and live in constant fear of their lives and safety. Hence, they flee to uh, these places like the so-called witch camps in Northern Ghana. There have also been instances in Malawi and the Central African Republic where alleged witches are sentenced to prison, not because they are guilty, but the judges will tell you, if I release these people to the village, if I release these people, if, I, if, if we acquit them and send them back to the communities, they will kill them. So what they do is that they sentence them to, uh, they give them some prison sentence, whereby they now be in prison. Meanwhile, the judges also know that, they, also, they know that these people are innocent, but instead of acquitting them, releasing them, they now you know, sentence them to prison. So they have to spend their time there. And we got to know this some years ago, and we'll be also campaigning uh, to make sure that, I mean, justice is done. If somebody is accused, somebody is innocent, the place to send the person is not a prison. Those who could go to prison are actually the accusers. Now, but we have a case in Central African Republic where people, uh, some alleged witches voluntarily go to prison to avoid being killed. So sometimes, like I, like I noted in the case of Ghana, some of these elderly women flee to, some, to what they call the witch camps. Now, in, in, in Central African Republic, some of them just go to the prison on their own. They volunteer, they, they just voluntarily go to avoid being killed. So, witch hunting poses a legal challenge in Africa. African countries such as Nigeria and Zimbabwe have provisions in their legal code that criminalize witchcraft accusation. So that is the thing. So sometimes people have been asking, what's the situation of the law? In Nigeria, witchcraft accusation is a crime. And this is a, a legal code they inherited from the colonial uh, days and colonial authorities. So, but what happens is that one thing is in the law, the law says a particular thing, but another thing goes on in practice. So in fact, as a campaigner against witch hunting, I didn't actually know growing up that witchcraft accusation was illegal in my country. It's just like maybe about 10 to 15 years ago, I discovered that it's, it's, it's illegal. Because one of the th some of the things people do on a day-to-day basis is witchcraft accusation. They do that in churches, they do that in mosques, they do that in marketplaces, they do that in the opening offices. So, but it's illegal. But the, some of these legal provisions are not enforceable because of the belief of the people. Uh, they believe in witchcraft, they believe in witches. So, um, so the, the, there are provisions in the penal code that criminalize witchcraft accusation and jungle justice. But these provisions are seldom enforced because police and court officials fear a backlash from the witch believing mob. So many of these people will tell you that they cannot enforce the law because the police will tell you that they could be overpowered. Because we have had instances in Zimbabwe, in Nigeria, where police will move into communities, they want to enforce the law, they get beaten up or, or their guns will be snapped, taken away from them by the mob. So there are cases like that. So the, because of this, uh, very often 
the the witchcraft accusation is something that the mob in quotes manages, which is of course illegal. So witch hunting is also a religious issue because witchcraft, witch persecution is driven by the belief in the occult and supernatural forces. Witch hunters are religious, traditional Christian and Islamic religious experts. So a lot of churches, mosques, a lot of clerics claim they have the power to identify and exorcise witchcraft. So they try to include it as part of their clerical work. So a lot of people who suspect witchcraft or who suspect that they have some occult, demonic uh, uh, possession issues, they go to these clerics who claim that they could conduct certain rituals to exercise and to remove the spirit of witchcraft. So this is exactly what is going on. It, it, it has become part and parcel of everyday Christianity, everyday Islam, and everyday traditional beliefs. So these religions have appropriated it and made it part and parcel of their everyday activities to find, identify, and exercise witchcraft. So there are priests, prophets, malams, other self-acclaimed possessors, dispensers, and manipulators of mystical agents and mystical and spiritual forces who continue to render their services to people. So in fact, there is a pastor that is, many pastors in Nigeria will openly tell you that witchcraft exists in the families and they can make your child sick, they can undermine your business. And of course, poverty is something that is very pervasive in the region. And people are always told that it is a witch in their family that is responsible. And when they tell them that, they begin to, of course, suspect somebody. If they point accusing fingers at somebody, very often elderly persons, single mothers, or single women, or even children. We have cases now where children are being accused, abandoned, because they are, they are branded witches or wizards. So witchcraft suspectors consult religious experts before making allegations, or when they suspect that something occultic and harmful is happening in their families. So the verdicts of these occult experts are believed to be divine and to be, to be true and certain. And that is why after certification of witchcraft suspicions, accusers act with vehemence and with impunity. So what happens is that when people suspect that somebody died as a result of witchcraft, they will go and consult these so-called priests or traditionalists who will do some incantations, who will cast some stones on the floor and now tell them, okay, this is the person who did it. The person is white, elderly, or the person is a woman. Just make some vague pro pronouncements and the person will now come back home and now bounce on a particular uh, fellow, the neighbor, beat the person up, and there the problem continues. So they treat the accused without mercy after doing this consultation because they believe that what the diviner said, what the priest said, what the malam said is true and is from God. So they now come back uh, and uh, they will now brutally treat the person uh, or, mis or they, they mistreat the suspected uh, witch. As the cases have shown, witch hunting is also a health issue and indicates the state of medical care. Traditionally, the, the line demarcating the medical from the religious sector is blood. Medical experts double as religious experts. Priests are doctors, doctors are priests. When you go to doctors, doctors, I, I think I had it today when I was at the, at the, at the, at the Salem Museum. Um, uh, doctors will tell you, oh, this is not ordinary. This is not what science can cure, you know? And immediately doctors say that. Sometimes this is because the doctor is not well trained. The doctor may not have equipment or may not have the medicine, may not have um, you know, what is required to properly diagnose and treat the ailment. So what they will tell the patient is that, oh, this is not an ordinary illness. This is not something you can cure in the hospital. Immediately people say that they begin to suspect witchcraft. They begin to suspect that somebody is spiritually behind that. And immediately the people begin to pursue and go along that line Somebody is going to be accused. Somebody is going to be beaten. Somebody is going to be subjected to some trial by ordeal. So people have more trust in healers than doctors. When it comes to those matters, some, uh, some kind of uh, 
uh, incurable ailments or ailments that are just maybe uh, such that people cannot afford the treatment. So they begin to have that suspicions and they now trust healers or, or faith healers now more than they trust medical doctor or, tr or they put their trust when it comes to medical advice. So people have more trust in this healer because they are believed to have supernatural powers. Because the, the, the notion there is that, for instance, people will tell you there is something God, there is nothing God cannot heal. Yeah, there's that notion. Yeah, so immediately you, 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 you are sick and people supernaturalize it. It goes into the witchcraft world. So they, 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 they can put the witchcraft narrative, they can put the demonic narrative, they can put the God narrative to make sense of it. And, um, but within that, within, within that, as they're doing it this way, somebody is being sus suspected. They're pointing accusing fingers at somebody, so someone somewhere. So they, they are believed to have supernatural powers and in the absence of a, robo of a robust health infrastructure in post-colonial African communities, witchcraft act allegation is a healing accessory. Yes, yes, that's what, that's what it is. So people go there to find their healing or to the search of healing. In fact, there was a situation in Ghana where a woman was accused of being responsible for the death of the daughter. And um, they took the, the daughter to this guy who had no medical training, none, no medical training. Because I visited him. This guy is always drunk. He will take this gin, this um, uh, whiskey, whiskey. He's always drunk. You know, when I met him, you know, the guy was always drunk. And uh, and from there, he will be making all sorts of pronouncement, reckless pronouncement, and they will think he's divine. And that's how he, he diagnoses ailment and all that. So they go to these people who are not medically trained, but only because they can make some incantations, they can sprinkle blood here and there and say a few things. Then that, that, that makes them healers. So in the absence of this health infrastructure, many people go to these places and they use the narrative of witchcraft to establish a cause of illness, death, or other misfortune. So when, like, there's a recent case, somebody, you know, was driving a motorbike without headlight in the night. I mean, come on. So the person now crashed. The person had an accident. They said, oh, no, somebody was responsible. It was not an ordinary death. So they go, they went and had some consultation. From there, they pointed accusing fingers at an elderly woman who was tortured and beaten to death because she refused to admit that she was responsible for the accident. So, um, but allegations of witchcraft apply and are effective in situations where the alleged resign to the imputations or unable to contest and take measures to neutralize allegations. As you can see from the pictures, these are elderly women. There's, it's difficult for them to resist these allegations. So apparently they torture and beat them. I mean, I also had that today. They torture you to confess. If you refuse, the more they torture. So that's exactly what happens. So at the end of the day, many of them die in the course of the torture because they refuse you know, to confess, to be responsible for what they did not do. So incidentally, very little has been done to address abuses linked to witchcraft beliefs. And part of the reason is that many organizations operate with the Western anthropological notion that witchcraft accusation fulfills an important role in stabilizing African societies. Now, this is where I'm coming in because when in the course of my scholarship, in the course of my research, I learned that witch hunting in the West was a different thing from what is going on in Africa. So there was this issue, this kind of bifurcation is one thing for the West, is another thing for Africa. Now, my mind did not take it because what I was reading go, that went on uh, centuries ago was almost, I could see some parallels. I can see some, uh, or I can see some common patterns. But, uh, but the, the scholarship, the literature on, on um, African witchcraft will be telling you, oh, it's a different thing. So this was, I found this very challenging, you know, when I was doing the research. So there was this notion that Witchcraft is stabilizing African societies. It's not. Now, look at how can a, a society that killed their elderly, as we can see on the slide, how can that society be stable? So where did they see this stability? I'm still struggling to understand how Western anthropologists decided to misrepresent 
What is a vicious phenomenon? Killing people, banishing them, you know, uh, murdering them, uh, beating them to death, lynching them. How does that resonate with stability or, or benefit? So this was one of the challenges I found reading the, lit reading the literature and doing my research, because I think that there's a lot of misrepresentation of witchcraft in the, in the region. Now, the, the, the inept idea popularized by Western scholars that witchcraft is not a form of superstition in Africa, unlike in the West. I was in a class, I was, I, I was doing a class during my doctorate in Germany, and they, they, they said, that for people in the West, witchcraft is a form of superstition. But for Africa, it is not. I was shocked. I was actually, I became furious. I said, what do you mean? You know, and they could not really explain. They could, but there is this idea that it means something for us. On social media, people will tell us that, ah, that witchcraft is science for Africans. I said, what do you mean by science? What do, how, how is this science? So this misexplanation, Mis misrepresentation has been central to you know, the idea how witch hunting in Africa is being engaged. And one of the things I'm trying to do now is to see how to correct the misrepresentation, this, the, this misinterpretation, so that we can you know, mobilize necessary resources to end this vicious campaign going on in the region. Now, the, the UN has, has various departments that address issues that affect women and children and elderly people and people living with disabilities. And these agencies, including the Inter-African Committee, have accorded limited attention to witch hunting. A lot of UN agencies are finding it reluctant. They are reluctant to take up this campaign. Like the Inter-African Committee, I've been emailing them. I say, you campaign against harmful traditional practices. Why are you not taking up? Witch hunting. That's a, a harmful traditional practice. I never got a reply because it's, it's like whatever they do is being dictated, I don't know, from anywhere. And they focus on that, even though this is an agency that could take up this campaign and help to address it. But of course, things are changing. UNICEF is taking up the campaign and the other agencies are taking up the campaign, but they are still not... Um, they are still a bit superficial because I attended one of the uh, conferences of the of UNICEF, uh, and um, and the course of the conference, one of the judges was saying, "Oh, children cannot be witches, but I know there are witches and wizards." I told him this is contradiction. Yes. So so what they do is that you know wishy washy, you know, just say something and get your Esther code or per DM and go home. They don't care. They're not interested in what the substance of what is going on. Nobody, they just say something that to please UNICEF and go home and the trouble continues. There has not been a robust principled campaign to address this. I couldn't see it anyway, even in the UN agencies. Now the World Health Organization campaigns against health misinformation and disinformation. But this agency has been reluctant in highlighting health misinformation and disinformation that motivate witchcraft accusation and witch hunting. Like I said, it's a health issue. It's a medical issue. But, what, but the World Health Organization has been quiet. I have written them. They ignored me. I have been trying to persuade them. You, the agency in Africa should, should have as one of its uh, topics or preoccupations addressing the misinformation. When people die, don't go to witch doctors for goodness sake. What are you going there to do? When people are sick, don't go and be consulting people, casting stone on the floor, you know, and all that, and looking at mirrors to find out the cause of malaria or the cause of or, the, or how to treat malaria. No. So, but they have refused. They have kept quiet on this issue. And that is part of the problem. So they have refused to highlight the disinformation and misinformation. But recently, uh, at the, uh, the UN General Assembly uh, passed a resolution urging state parties to take measures to eliminate harmful traditional practices. But for now, that remains another paper tiger. Because, you know, we, we hear all this, oh, UN has passed a resolution. After that, everybody goes to sleep. Resolution cannot end this. Resolution, it has to, you know, there's this thing they say, they say you know, it, it must not only back or, you know, it, it must have to, it, it must not only be on paper, on practice. You know, it must, it must be effective. It must not just be a resolution and you pass it and maybe you archive it there. 
So we have had this. So the problem we have is translating this into mechanisms that can protect people like that woman there being beaten up, uh, being beaten up, and who, who was eventually lynched in front of people where she grew up. And some of them who, be, who, who eventually lynched her are, are, are the children or friends of our family friends. So we, we need effective mechanisms and resolutions to get this done. Now, as I try to conclude, so this unfortunate situation led to, the, to my formation of the Advocacy for Alleged Witches in 2020. So I started the Advocacy for Alleged Witches to fill in these missing gaps. Yes, harass the UN, harass the World Health Organizations, harass our, our excuse me, harass our scholars and anthropologists, our teachers, correct the misrepresentation, lobby organizations, let them understand that what went on centuries ago is still going on and that it is an unfinished business. Yes. And this is exactly what I want. I want, I want the, the, the Salem Witch Museum to understand that witch hunting is unfinished, that the history is still incomplete. You, it's only one sided we have. It has to be a global witch museum. And I hope that you know we can take this from there so that a lot of people from other cultures will also see the connection between what went on in the Western part of the world, in Salem, in, in, the, in, the, in the early modern Europe, and also what's going on out here now. Because that will help us bring in a more holistic approach to this phenomenon and to the problem. So the advocacy for alleged wishes uses uh, in, in what, what we call the information approach. We try to inform where misinformation is being used. We, we are trying to intervene where people you know, refuse to intervene, where they are unwilling to act. And, um, and, that's, uh, so, so, and that, takes me, that takes us to the next slide where you, you know, I've explained the political, the legal, and the religious aspects of this, and also the medical aspects. Um, and now, this, I, I'm going to conclude by telling you about this, uh, this, this very case. On, the, on that side, there is Blessing. Blessing was accused of witchcraft and tortured. They set up that fire, middle of the night, sat her very close. You can see it from the picture, very close to the fire because they wanted her to admit, to confess, to have, to, to have killed somebody you know, through witchcraft. She denied, they keep pushing her close to the fire and the, the fire had to, you know, she sustained some wounds, you know, at her back and all that. So we eventually rescued um, um, uh, Blessing. And this was, a, we, we took her away from the village. And what I'm just letting you know, yesterday, the person who did this, who led the mob, was charged to court in Nigeria yesterday. Yes. So we were monitoring this from here. Because what happens in cases like that is that when it happens like this, people keep quiet and the matter will fizzle out. So what we're trying to do now is that no more, it, that, that trend will not continue. We'll have to do whatever we can to send a strong message to people who do this, that at least we have the law. The laws are there, but is it the will to implement it? So we have been able to rescue her and we are hoping to support her, get her back to school and, you know, get her to get over the trauma of what happened. So this is part of the things we are trying to do at the at advocacy for alleged witches. So in conclusion, ending witch persecution in Africa is long overdue. Yes, it's long overdue. And, uh, and, and this can happen sooner or later. And that's why we gave ourselves the target of 2030. Some people said it's premature. Some people said we, it's a pipe dream. Some people said they're telling me all sorts of things. But it is important we set a, a target because this thing going on is not something we should actually be talking about in this century. So there's, there's a need for us to really you know, approach it with a sense of urgency. So um, because this problem has been going on because of moral failure behind witch hunting in Africa, then this moral failure has to be addressed. And at the, at the same time, when there is a movement across Europe to rehabilitate victims of witch hunt, that this is an opportunity to end the raging witch hunts in African societies and put this miscarriage of justice to a stop. Yeah, so just like Sarah, you know, you know our colleague has told me about you know, a bill to exonerate or absorb 
you know, English people and terminologies, exonerate, absorb, apologize, all these things. I know that whichever one that works, you know, there's a need for us to achieve that closure. But as you are doing it here, you are sending a very clear message to the rest of the world. You are too late. Yes. Come up, move on, make progress, take steps. So that is why I'm inspired by what is going on here in the United States. I'm also inspired by what's going on in Scotland, where there's been a campaign to honor the, these people. Because as you are honoring them, you are sending a very clear message to people across the world. Yes. So that is why I, you know, uh, what we're doing at the at Advocacy for Alleged Witches is, is getting a boost from what is going on here in the United States and what is going on in other parts of the world. And I hope that we will continue to do this. And, um, and again, um, hopefully um, we will establish a museum um, somewhere in Nigeria in my lifetime. Yes. So because that will help us also to begin to connect the stories because the stories are connected. The experiences are connected. Yeah, we can connect the stories and hopefully uh, one day we will also have tourists coming and we'll be showing them that, yeah, this happened many years ago as, you know, as Rachel, you know, was and the colleagues, you, 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 you recounted to me today. So I stopped there and uh, maybe uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. That was incredible. That was so fascinating and heartbreaking. And uh, I think just from, I mean, speaking from my perspective, so interesting to hear the very clear similarities. You know, the we talked yeah. about this a little bit today, but the pattern of scapegoating is something that seems to transcend time and space, unfortunately. It's a very human thing to do no matter where you are. Um, so we have time for questions. If anybody has a question, you can either unmute or please feel free to put the question in the chat and we will read it aloud. Let me see if I can make. Let me see here. Let me see if I can make your uh, screen bigger. Oh, there we go. We have some thank yous. Mm -hmm. So I have a question while, while we're waiting, if anybody else does. Uh, so what inspired you? I mean, you, you talked about obviously your research, but um, in 2020 to start this organization, you know, what were the, uh, what kind of precipitated that? What were the immediate things that got you to a place where you, formed an organization? Was it your research or was it just your kind of lived experience? Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for this question. The, growing up, I grew up in a rural community in Southern Nigeria. And while I was growing up, some elderly women, innocently looking, you know, they, they were being accused. People were suspecting them. These people were, of course, growing old. Sometimes a lot of people think that growing old is the more you grow old, the more occultic you become. Actually, the more frail, the organs are failing, you need a lot of support. Now, people who need a lot of support are treated as if they are evil and they should be eliminated. And those who need a lot of care are now treated Really, so I, I was I was trying to understand the reason for the maltreatment of people who are accused of witchcraft, who are mainly elderly people. While I was growing up, and when I asked those questions, they gave me very bad answers. Mm. Yes, I got something that sounded stupid, foolish, or something that I could not actually comprehend. Number one, they say, "Oh, this person has been killing others." How they cannot say? How are they killing people? And of course, after a few years, you hear, oh, the person has passed away. The person is dead. Oh, oh, this person has powerful, to, has a, had the power to kill others. Now, when death comes, he could not stop it. And again, when you also see um, occasions where they beat up 
alleged witches. You ask yourself, if this person is actually as powerful as believed, do you think the person will like that? Okay, you saw the woman. They were hitting the woman. And you, you know that this woman is weak. You know that. So I, where are the powers? I can't see the powers. I couldn't see them. So I could not reconcile. I could not match the treatment with the accusations. I couldn't see any justification for that. So, and when I ask questions, nobody gives me any good answer. So that was one. Number two, I, I continue to read and I continue to read about other cultures. Now I found out that what was going on then or what is still going on happened in Europe and in the, you know, in the US centuries ago. And it's like, wow, okay. It's like we are far behind time. And you know, it's not just last year. It's not like 10 years ago. It's not like 100 years ago. And when they say they say centuries ago, let me say, so I feel ashamed. Yes, I want to be honest to you. I feel ashamed that I belong to a culture that is still, you know, you know, going ahead with something that other cultures have abandoned 300 years ago. Come on. So I just said, whether I will succeed or not, whether I have the means or not, the box stops at my own table this time around. I will give it a fight. If I succeed, so be it. But let it be that I gave it a fight. So I, I and again, I looked around. You, you talk to the UN agencies or UN officials. They, have, they are more interested in keeping their jobs instead of doing the work. Mm -hmm. And you talk to WHO, the same thing. You know, when they get there, they pay them huge salary. So when you talk about things that border on passion and cause and things they really need to do, they just think that you are disturbing them. So, okay. Now, I went to the university. I look at the literature. Literature was saying something completely off the point. Yes. They were just, you know, explaining away something that is very serious. I said, no. Okay. I will have to be fighting on different fronts. So I fight the UN. I fight the WHO. I fight the scholars and all that. And, you know, I'm not fighting based on what I don't know. I'm fighting based on what is going on in my society. And I can tell you, I know very well. So it's like, it is a duty to myself. It's a duty to humanity. It is my own way of making sense of the trauma. One goes, every imagine having these stories. Let me tell you, I get these stories like the one I'm showing you on the screen right now. I get stories like that, you know, virtually once a week or once in two weeks. And my family members used to ask me, how do you cope? I said, the way I cope is to call the police and make sure they go after the perpetrators, make sure they're in jail, make sure they're taken to court, or make sure they're on the run or they're hiding. Make sure that the power equation, I tilt it in favor of the accused and, and, and against the accusers. So yes, that's what inspired me. I just feel that this is what needs to be done and I'm not going to leave it for another generation to do it. Let me give it a, a trial. Let me uh, let me give it. Let me attempt it, and hopefully one may succeed. That's great. That is great. I think we have a we have a question here in the chat from Ben. It says you mentioned that some countries have more witchcraft accusations than others. So Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria, etc. And what are some of the cultural, social, economic, and other factors that make them especially common in one place instead of another? I think that's a great question. Yeah. What are we looking for exactly? Like what makes sets these apart, I guess, that makes them kind of a hot spot, if you will, for these accusations? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, these are very important question. And academically, academically, this is a PhD question. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 So now the thing is this. There are so many factors that come together. And I'm going to describe this based on the cases I'm handling. First of all, in rural communities, the police presence is very limited. Yes. The state presence that works with the constitution and the law is very limited. And now, in a village maybe of about three, four, five thousand people, you have a police station with about five police officers or something like that, or less. And they don't have any equipment or they have buttons. You can't use buttons to go and confront a mob. Yes. Yeah. So, and the mob easily overpower the police officers in these rural areas. Now, in the urban settings, we don't usually have much of that because the police that are usually not too far from the people. But we have that going on, let's say, in, in the slums. Yes. And of course, there's also this idea that uh, the people fly, at, uh, fly out at night. I had it today when I was at the museum. 
you know, people flying out at night and all that. And it's like, wow, okay. They're still, fly, you know, they're still flying out. It's not history. In, in Lagos, the rowdy places, that's where they fly. They usually fly. Where people are so confused, people are moving up and down and all that. So we have that happening in places where there is limited police presence. Again, uh, economic uh, stress, you know, when there is, when, when people, um, you know, uh, people cannot really have the socioeconomic support they need. Like during the COVID, a lot of people were out of work. Some people were accusing some other others to have tied their destiny. They said they have tied their destiny. You know, they cannot make progress again. So they blamed some of these people for the, econo the economic woes, unemployment. Sometimes people who have um, a child bad difficulties, if people get married, they cannot conceive, you know, and they don't have the means either to do IVF or do other things, other ways to really, you know, either conceive, they now find somebody to blame. So immediately people have this situation where their means are not taken care of, economic, political, especially, you know, when they have when when they have that situation, it is also a problem. Then, uh, what are, what is it? So, a combination of weak state institutions, economic uh, challenges, distress, poverty, um, and of course a social environment where illiteracy. When I say illiteracy here, and I'm, it's not all about speaking English. A lot of people speak English, but their brains, you know. Do not, you know. So the 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 education is just is not all about speaking English. It's also all about thinking, you know, improving the um, the way they think. So a lot of what happens in, in in Nigeria now is that a lot of people are not getting the very sound education, mm -hmm. and these people are growing without sound education, and they go they become the rural leaders, community in rural areas. So they, they, they just have to use the customs and traditions and witchcraft narratives in order to manage things. So there are so many factors that come together. But the way forward is this. Stronger state institutions, more police presence. Of course, poverty will have to go. As long as people continue to you know, be poor and live in poverty, and impoverished places without amenities, without access to hospitals and access to healthcare, you know, it will be difficult for them to move away from making these accusations. But again, let me not just also, you know, shoot my campaign on the foot hands because I'm not sure poverty is going away from Africa anytime soon. Okay, but it does not mean that people cannot also find a way to make a common sense. You know, uh, uh, interpretation of their situation. Yes, in other words, because people are poor, then they 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 they, they have to be killing their elderly ones. At, you know, as a result of witchcraft. No, what I'm trying to say there now is that a whole lot will also have to come in. People need to understand that there is no connection. This connection is not there. And, and some sometimes you don't need to be rich or poor. You just need to be well educated to know that you don't pursue false ends and false connections just because you want to make sense of your poverty. So what I'm saying there is that a whole lot of factors are responsible, but with a robust set institution, with a better economic situation, I think that we will see this, you know, uh, the, the, this problem, you know, move away. It's interesting listening to you talk. Those are all factors that we, uh, you know, identify in the European witch hunts, right? As well in the early modern period. Places that had weaker governments, that had economic problems. You know, these are the places where we see large witch hunts. So, right. and it, then places like Denmark that we see had a really strong um, court system then that kind of prevented things like confession before torture. We see though while they still existed, they were at a much lower rate. So it's interesting. Yeah. So uh, I think we have time for one more question. If anybody has a final question. Well, thank you so much for your time and for this presentation. Um, before we let you go, can you tell us uh, where can we find advocacy for alleged witches? What are the best ways to support your organization? Um, yeah, give us give us all the details of how to continue learning after this presentation. Okay. Um, 
Yes. That's a very important question. You know, I missed this slide. So <laughs> <laughs> great minds think yeah. alike. <laughs> yeah. How do you support us? Now, let me tell you the best support you can give is this very one. We need a connection between witch hunting going on in Africa with witch hunting in the rest in the in other parts of the world. This disconnect is in, you know has been doing a lot of harm. So we need that connection. Yes. So I would I would like to see something going on in trying to connect what we're doing in Africa with what is going on at the museum. What is going on in terms of witch hunting generally? Yes. Yes, we are part of it. I want I want to hear about witch hunting in the Western world. I also want the world to hear about witch hunting in Africa. I need that connection. Yes, that's one of the things I want to achieve. So anything that gives me that connection is primary to, it, 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 to in terms of support. Yes. Um, again, we need platforms. Yes, I don't want it, I don't want us to stop when we are recounting witch hunting. We finish. Salem, Europe, mm -mm. Europe and America, they're not only the only part of the world. We are part of the uh, we are part of it. So include us. We, we, we want a seat on the table. Yes, because that is how we can begin to send a message. Like now, right there in, in, in Nigeria, I used to tell them, I said, look, people are apologizing in Scotland for this. Exoneration is being sought for something that happened 300 years ago. And that thing you are doing it today. Are you, you know? Is it, not, is it not something that will make you to rethink your position? So what I'm saying is that when you give us platform, when you connect what you are doing with us, you are helping in a, in a way you cannot actually measure in trying to push back the tide of witch hunting. Now, draw attention of international organization or Africa interested organization to witch hunting. You know, mainstream this topic when they're discussing. Yes, we need mainstreaming of the topic of witch persecution in Africa. And of course, what all organizations, NGOs ask for, donations, you know, to help us. Because we need to, you know, support our volunteers, sometimes help them do the work, incentivize or provide, um, encourage them in terms of paying them some money here and there so that they can get our work done. So we will need financial support to get people to continue to do the work for us. I think that with this, as I as I listed there, um, I think we can, you know, we'll be happy. And you can look out for us on Facebook. You can also look out for us on Twitter. And um, we have a page right now, a, a, a page, a web page where we have a few some information out there. And uh, otherwise, reach out to the Salem Witch Hunt Museum. I'm, I'm sure Rachel will know how to contact us. So, or you reach out to Sarah eh? or Josh, you know, that I'm getting a network of friends around the globe. So reach out to any of them. I think every, anything you, you send through them will get to us right away. Well, wonderful. So I, I, this is certainly not the end. I will be emailing you tomorrow. <laughs> so it, it was a truly a pleasure to hear you speak this evening and to meet you. Um, this was something which I told you earlier today, I knew very little about. Um, and it's incredibly important for us to understand. Um, so we will certainly, you know, you haven't heard the last from us for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. And for anyone who lives in this area, if you would like to see Dr. Igwe speak in person, he will be speaking at the Rebecca Nurse Homestead tomorrow evening. Um, or, you know, if anybody else is interested in attending this lecture, please let them know. Um, but we will let you go. Thank you again for this wonderful presentation and enjoy the rest of your time in Salem. Yeah, you're welcome. Bye. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye.